right, I hope you got your Bibles. Um, I'm so fired up and I'm ready to, to get started. I got a lot of great announcements too that um, stick around to the end because got a lot of exciting stuff. Because um, next week starts Holy Week. Can you believe that? That's crazy. What's up, Tom? Hey, Carlos. John Winteroff finishing up his turkey, uh, his taco suit. Could be turkey suit. Kirsten Alleman. Oh, my goodness. What's up, Kirsten? And Lazarus, I'm sure. Good to see you guys. Well, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I hope you all can see me okay. I played a little bit with the lighting, and uh, I didn't start it sideways this time. So, um, man, I miss you guys. I wish I could see all your bright, shining, smiling faces and uh, look into your eyes. In fact, I, I, I read a funny joke yesterday. I'll start with this. Uh, a man asked his friend, he says, what color are your pastor's eyes? And the friend answered, he says, I don't know. When he prays, he closes his eyes. And when he preaches, I close mine. But don't, how about that? I hope y'all don't close your eyes. Hope you don't fall asleep on me. Don't fall asleep on me tonight. All right, go ahead and pull up your Bible. Open up your favorite Bible app, Psalm 107. I'm going to read from the NKJV tonight. The NKJV. And um, as you get that up, go ahead and bow with me. And let's have a word of prayer as we get started, okay? Father, we thank you that we can form your church, regardless of being in a building or wherever we are across the miles. Thank you, Lord, that you are bigger than any divide and that uh, you are not limited by anything. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would be our teacher yet again tonight. Open the eyes of our heart as we study your word, reveal deep truth to us, show us something. Even if we've read something a hundred times, your word is endless and vast and unsearchable for its depth of truth. So we pray you just reveal it tonight. Show it to us. Help us to be more like you because of this time together. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. 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 All right. Let me say hi to a few more people. Hey, Katie Buchanan. Hey, April. Good to see you. Hey, Lindsay. All right. <laughs> Tom, good to see you guys. All right. Well, people are going to be joining us in and out and stuff, but I want to get started. I want to ask you guys a question. Um, I've been getting a ton of these emails and devotionals, a lot of good stuff. Um, and I got one that sets up perfectly our study tonight. I learned something really, really cool this week. And I was reading one of my many online devotionals that, that uh, I get and pastors get, you know, we just get tons of those. And one of my favorite ones that I get always is uh, Dr. Dave Jeremiah's um, weekly one. And he, he does a daily one as well. And it caught my attention. <clears throat> and it dealt with the current state of our world as we fight against this war uh, against an invisible enemy, the coronavirus, right? The uh, COVID-19. And Dr. Jeremiah pointed out that every year or every war needs a great PR department, a public relations department. Public relations on the home front greatly affect the result on the battlefront. And sometimes it can even mean the, the, the difference between victory and defeat. That's why back in World War II, just one day after Britain declared war on Germany and against Hitler, the English government established a brand new ministry called the Ministry of Information, the MOI. This is so cool. On September 4th, 1939, right after they declared war, they formed this because they knew how important it was to lift the nation's morale during a tough time. Does that sound familiar? So they knew that the bombings were coming, gas attacks were likely coming, uh, deaths were inevitable, and an invasion was looking very, very likely. So they were naturally on edge and they were scared. So the Ministry of Information was determined to bolster that famous British uh, stiff upper lip. You know what I mean? That, that, that they're known for, that keep a stiff upper lip. So they wanted to get information into the people's hands as fast as possible. Now, they didn't have internet. They didn't have computers yet. Not even the Commodore 64 had been invented. So they printed posters. And one of the very first projects that the Ministry of Information did was three separate posters. And all of these were very simple. They pick a bold color and they used a very easy to read white font. All right. And then they would put the, the crown of King George VI on top of the poster. And the simple slogan would be handed out to be put up in, 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 you know, pubs and in restaurants and anywhere people gathered. The first sign that they made had a very simple motto that said this, your courage, your cheerfulness, your resolution will bring us victory. And that was it. They printed a million of those and they hung up everywhere. That was a blue background with white letters and they put it just about anywhere they could think people would need to see a word of encouragement. Then the ministry made a second poster. This one was a green background, and it had white letters on it, simple font, that said, Freedom is in peril. Defend it with all your might. 
That's what it said. This one was in case things got ramped up a little bit, and they had to really encourage the people, but also put them on guard. And they made a half million of these. They put them up in the bus stops and the train stations and shop windows, everywhere they could. But the Ministry of Information designed a third poster that no one knew about. It was a third poster. They printed millions of copies of this, but they were never seen because these were shipped to a secret warehouse and intended to be distributed only in case the worst case scenario happened, the worst of the worst. And that is when German boots landed on British soil. So in other words, the poster was only to be shown to anyone in the event of an invasion. The poster was simple. It featured that white font that everyone had known, gotten to see on the first two posters, and a red background that had just five simple words beneath the picture of the crown from the King of England. Can anyone guess what it said? Anybody know? Anybody get it right? There it is. Keep calm and carry on. Now, as we know, England was spared the invasion. It didn't happen, thankfully. So every last one of these posters was shredded. They destroyed them. They said they didn't need them, so they ground them into pulp, and they absolutely destroyed them and threw them away. Or did they? Stick around, and I want to show you something really cool at the end of the Bible study, okay? You'll enjoy it. But what most people miss is this simple phrase, keep calm and carry on, actually reflects a biblical truth. England wasn't the only nation to face the threat of invasion. Think about King Ahaz. We, we see this in Bible times all over. Judah was facing invasion not by one person, but by two different armies. It was like a double whammy coming. And the Lord gave a prophet Isaiah this, this message. I listen to the terminology. He says, be careful and keep calm. Don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood. Isn't that great? I love how Isaiah describes these two enemies that are coming in. He says, Don't be afraid of them. They're nothing more than smoldering stubs of firewood. Even earlier, Moses had told the Israelites by the Red Sea the same message. Don't be afraid. Just stand still. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. That is your job. So tonight's word is brought to you by calm, okay? That is it. It is brought to you by the letter C for calm. And this is a message that is so powerful for us where we are today in this time of pandemic. That same message resonates. Be mindful. Have the mind of Christ. Keep calm. Don't lose heart. Stand still. The Lord is going to fight for you. And I hope those words are going to reverberate in your heart tonight because the devil's going to try to invade your turf. He's going to try to rob you of your peace, you know, but we know the Prince of Peace. During these chaotic times, we can still fix our thoughts on Jesus. We can claim his perfect peace, and we can persevere. Remaining calm is possible because of God's promises. Now, this past Sunday, you remember, we looked at one of the largest storms ever mentioned in Scripture. In fact, it had a name. Anybody remember it? Bonus points. Let me scroll and see if anybody mentioned it here. Yep, yep. Hey, Trisha Bell, good to see you. Hey, Sam, you'll Roy Shaver. All right, and then thank you, Jason. Jason's going to be putting these notes. If you're a note taker, I'll try to tell him about it. But if you don't remember the name, we studied it on Sunday. The name of the storm was Eurachlodon, and it was a powerful storm that just about ruined Paul and all the people traveling with him. Tonight we read of another stormy scenario. It's in Psalm 107. So if you got it, go ahead and open there to this 23rd verse. We'll read probably six or seven verses of this, okay? Psalm 107, starting in verse 23. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves of the sea. They mount up to the heavens and they go down again to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits end. Boy, does this sound familiar? Does this sound like some of the people we know that are, that are struggling? But I love verse 28. Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brings them out of their distresses. He calms the storm. Did you catch that? He calms the storm so that the waves are still. Then they're glad because they're quiet. So he guides them to their desired haven. And I want to focus on that word tonight because we need to hear this. That word in verse 29, calm. Originally, that was a word that applied to weather. It was a weather term. It actually comes from a Latin word that was used for hot or uh, still. 
and, and to find a, a still dry time, like a windless day. And it's used that way right here in scripture. In verses 27, 28, and 29, it refers to a group of sailors who turn to God in the middle of a storm. Look at verse 27 again. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man. They're at their wits end. My family, we've been watching Pirates of the Caribbean. This is one of the things that, that we've been doing, doing a marathon. And every time I picture the, this, this verse and these guys, I always picture this. Is it just me? This is, this is what I think of right here. Johnny Depp, he's just staggering around. He's either doing that or he's running from people. I love his face here. It's just, it is classic Johnny Depp. And he's staggering to and fro like a drunken man. But then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble. And he brings them out of their distress. He calms the storm. This is the only time, though, that God's word says this. This is a promise for you. you yep, I'm looking at you right there in your little footy pajamas. I see you right here. Listen, listen to, to all these verses. I want you to count how many times you hear the word calm, okay? During another terrible storm in the book of Jonah, the runaway prophet says this. Pick me up, throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm. How about that? Mark 4, Jesus rebukes the waves and the wind during that storm on the sea, and he says, the wind ceased and there was great calm. So you know I got to ask. This is what I love to do. How about you? How you doing with that? Do you have calm? Do you need some? Well, you're in the right place. And that's okay. You're not alone. You're feeling that way. Let me say hi to a few people while we're here. Hey, Virginia Triplett. Hope you and Mike are doing well. Nancy McCarroll, you got it. You're Rockladon. That's right. Nice, Katie. Good job. JJ Sunny Vucich is watching. Good to see you, man. Love you guys. Your Aunt Natalie. My Aunt Natalie's on here? Hey, Aunt Natalie. Good to see you. All right. Yeah, I saw that. That's awesome. All right, so I'm going to get a drink, and we're going to keep going here. According to Webster, I looked this up, the, the definition of the word calm means without rough motion, not windy, not stormy, free from disturbance, tranquil, and serene. Now, be honest. Is that describing you right now? Because there's some times where I watch the news a lot or I get these pastor updates and there's stuff that comes across my desk that I wish I hadn't seen. And if I give in to it, it starts to rob me of my peace. You know what I mean? It starts. You start to focus on it. Sometimes you got to turn it off, and and dive back into the Word. You know, because when we're worried, chances are our eyes are off the Lord. They're on our problem, right? Right here, just staring right at that severe myopia where we're just tunnel vision on the problem, and we forget how big God is, and we know that He's sovereign. Nothing escapes His knowledge, and and the Bible uses the word calm to describe how the Lord wants to settle these these weather patterns in our heart, in our mind. King David did that in Psalm 131. Listen, he said, surely I have calmed and quieted my soul. I love that. That's what we need to do. King Solomon said something very similar in Proverbs 17, 27. He says, a man of understanding is a calm spirit. All right, so be honest. All right, it's just us. I'm going to lean in here. When your family looks at you this week, do they see a man with a calm spirit? When your kids look at you, when your wife or ladies, when your husband looks at you, that's how I want to be. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul. Jesus was asleep when people thought their lives were in danger, in the boat, in the storm. He slept through it. That's how much peace and, and calmness he had. And we can live with that calmness and that confidence because of God's word. He promises. Isaiah 26, 3 says this, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So there it is. It's not a blanket statement. It's for those who trust in him. Even when this world is falling apart and we've got panic and fear, we can keep calm. We can still be compassionate. We can keep calm and be constructive. We can stay calm and committed to loving God, loving people. And uh, I mean, there's no, there's no getting around. We're not trying to be Pollyannish or uh, you know, see things through rose-colored glasses and pretend that things aren't there. We're living in chaotic times. But again, to quote Isaiah, in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. So there's your first challenge as we walk through each day and ultimately we await the Lord's return. The attitude of our heart and our mind should resemble Jesus. It should be one of calmness. These things I have spoken to you, said Jesus, 
that in me you may have peace. That's powerful. John 16, 33, if you want to look that up. Now, I know this may seem like a rough thing to, to achieve, this, this attitude of peace and to experience calmness during a pandemic. I mean, how in the world can anyone feel peaceful and calm right now when the whole world seems to be in total chaos? I get it. Pastor, don't you know that there is a deadly virus just out there that is wreaking havoc on the planet? Don't you know that if you have a weak immune system uh, or your immune system has been compromised in any way, don't you know that this virus could take you out? Yeah, absolutely. I know. I won't minimize it. I'm aware of it. In fact, I did some research. I looked into the word immune. And I wanted to, to find a little, uh, a little nugget of truth for you here. And in my research, and I was reading some of these, these great things that, that, that come across, I wish I could remember who quoted this, but I learned a lot about our amazing body and how God designed our immune system that he gave each one of us. All right, so check this out. This is according to the Merck Manual of Medical Information. The function of the immune system is to defend the body against invaders. Did you catch that? The function of the immune system is to defend the body against invaders. Oh, church, I am going somewhere so deep with this. Don't let this go over your heads. In other words, microbes, okay, those, those germs and, and, and other microorganisms. It could be cancer cells or uh, even transplanted tissues or, or organs. The immune system initially sees these and recognizes them as intruders. In fact, they think it's their job to attack them and to defeat them. And the immune system is based on the body's lymphatic system, which coordinates all those key body parts, lymph nodes and tonsils and bone marrow and your spleen, your liver, your lungs, and, and, and all that stuff, okay? And it organizes to deploy lymphocytes. These are those antibodies, okay, that go out and they attack the invaders. I'm going somewhere with this. Are you ready? This is, this is going, okay? An infection, let's say you cut your finger and you get an infection in your finger. This might lead to a swollen lymph node somewhere higher up, maybe in your elbow, as your body begins to corral the infectious germs to transport them off and destroy them. Okay, this is an amazing system, and God designed this. As I study this a little deeper, it's almost like God has an immune system designed to protect us from external invaders too. Okay, these outside invaders, these germs, if you will, put in quotes, could be things like financial shortfalls. Uh, job disruptions, broken relationships, family problems, uh, natural disasters, accidents, discouragement, doubt, despair, loneliness, illness, you name it. Any of those things can wreak havoc on our personal life and affect our spiritual life. So when these things happen to Christians, what do we hear? We hear the age-old question, why do bad things happen to good people? If someone were to ask you that, what would you say? It's a great question, and it's a valid question. There's nothing wrong with having questions or even having doubts. I think it's wrong to keep them and never do anything with them, never investigate, never give God a chance to speak. But it's not wrong to have those. Think about this. Why do bad things happen to good, good people? Look back through the ages. I mean, think about some of our heroes of the faith. Think about Abraham and Joseph and Moses and David and Esther and uh, Jeremiah, Paul, Peter, even Jesus himself. All their troubles, all their trials, all these things happening to good people can be summarized up in a very overlooked verse, okay? It's Hebrews 5, 8. And this, listen to how Jesus responded to suffering. This is gold. You ready? Though he was a son, talking about Jesus, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Did you catch that? Let me read it again. Though Jesus, who is the son of God, Yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. He didn't learn obedience through the good things. He didn't. This is Jesus. Jesus. If Jesus learned obedience, the Lord himself, in his mysterious mix of divinity and humanity, if he had to learn from suffering, how much more are we? What does that say about us? I mean, think about that. If the heroes of our faith, you to go read Hebrews chapter 11, you can see the Hall of Fame right there. If those heroes found themselves invaded by tests and trials and problems and all these things, what does that say about us? So if you find yourself not fully understanding why things happen, relax. You are in good company, okay? Relax. Cut yourself some slack. 
if God didn't keep his own son from experiencing troubles, there must be a divine reason why. You might understand that this side of heaven, we may not. It's in discovering all these reasons, though, that we learn deeper truths about God's immune system, kind of what we're talking about, a play on words with all this virus, all these problems we have, whether they're tiny germ-sized problems or whether they're gigantic pandemic-sized problems. How we view what is happening around us depends greatly on our perspective. You know what I'm talking about? Do we view the world through our limited, finite human reasoning, which can be greatly flawed, and greatly skewed, or are we going to intentionally pull back and view the world from a heavenly perspective? All right, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to leave you with five encouraging truths when problems invade your world. Are you ready for this? If you're a note taker, we're going to try to put these up for you, okay? These are uh, kind of rapid fire, so go ahead and get ready. Five encouraging truths for when problems invade our world. The first one is this. Invading problems bring with them great opportunities. Invading problems bring with them great opportunities. Let me ask you something. Tell me what all these people have in common. You ready? Here's a list for you. See if you can connect the dots. What do all these famous writings and, and writers have in common? Uh, Paul's letter to Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, uh, Philemon, the book of Revelation from John, uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Letters and Papers from Prison, uh, Martin Luther's translation of the New Testament into German. What do all those have in common? Every one of those was written while in prison or in exile. Every one of them. And they are full of hope. I wonder if they would be different if they weren't. If they weren't in prison, if they weren't in prison, would it change it? You know, we don't know for sure. We do know that these men of God didn't miss an opportunity to capitalize on the moment. In the middle of their suffering, they seized it and they advanced the kingdom. Problems represent opportunities for those who are willing to embrace them. Okay? So invading problems bring with them great opportunities. Number two, I want to leave you with this. Invading problems promote maturity, especially spiritual maturity. Invading problems promote spiritual maturity. You remember the verse I read just a minute ago from Hebrews uh, 5, 8, I believe? It begins by saying, even though Jesus was God's son, he suffered. What? What parent likes to see his son or daughter suffer? Think about that. I mean, when we had our first child, when we had Marin, <laughs> some of you all know us, we had to learn to resist the temptation to always be rescuers of our children to be helicopter parents, hovering over them, stepping in, rescuing them. Anytime they would experience the slightest bit of difficulty, there we were to zoom, to helicopter in, right? We saw it tonight, or today I was looking out my window, getting ready for tonight, and there's Milo with Mercy. And every now and then, you know, I'd be going over my notes and I'd hear her, her cry. I'm like, oh, she's dying, something's wrong. I got, Call 911, you, start chest compressions. And we would go to the window and her crying would be either a laughter or she would be yelling for something, but I'd freak out, you know, I've gotten better. I didn't rush downstairs this time, you know. What parent wants to see their kids suffer? No one likes to do that, but suffering often brings this spiritual maturity, All right? Here's the truth, and I'm going to say this kind of quiet because we don't like to hear this, but, but it's so true. It's in the fire that we are brought to the end of ourselves. It's in the fire that we come to the end of ourselves, end of our resources. Some of us are coming up real close to that, awfully fast. And in that fire, we are forced to cry out to God. We're forced to lean into God. That's why it's sometimes important for our kids to go through tough times, you know? And that's why God allows them for us. All right, number three, you ready? Invading problems prove integrity. I like this one. Invading problems prove integrity. The famous preacher of old, Henry Ward Beecher, said this, We never know how much one loves till we know how much he is willing to suffer and endure. In other words, what we are until we suffer is merely reputation. What we are while we suffer is character. Man, isn't that good? Reputation is what people think you are. But character is what God knows you are. 
there's a huge difference, isn't there? See, our goal is to make them both line up. To be the same person behind closed doors that we are in front of people. You know, we've heard people all the time say, well, you don't understand, man, my situation made me do this. My situation did this. My, his environment did this. We don't buy into the victim mentality. The, the, situation, the situation revealed who we were. See what I'm saying? Tough times reveal our character, what we're made of. You know, the easy times, that's easy to endure. But the tough time, Pastor Bill had this great saying, and I, I was texting him yesterday, and he sent me it. I said, what was that quote, Diane, if you're there, maybe you can get him to, to quote it again. But basically, he was saying when he was younger, he was thinking, you know, when he got older, he couldn't wait because he, you just naturally get cuddly and, 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 and kind and, and soft-hearted. And, and uh, he said, it's not true. That, your character doesn't change. In fact, if anything, you get more entrenched. It reveals your character more. You know what I'm talking about? Getting older, you get more entrenched. And sometimes that just reveals more, more of who you are. And you have to lean into Christ more. It's even harder to change the older we get. The modern business writer Tom Peters said this. He said, there's no such thing as a minor lapse of integrity. You either had integrity or you don't. You lapsed or you didn't. Job and his wife saw him sitting there in a, in a heap of ashes, right? He's wearing a sackcloth. He's covered with boils. He's scraping them with pottery and the dogs are coming. It's just disgusting. And he, she looks at him and says, why do you persist in holding on to your integrity? I love Job's response. He held on to his integrity because... That was a possession that no pain can strip away. Only pain can reveal it. Reputation is who men think you are. Character is what God knows you are. All right? Two more, and then I'm going to let you go. I hope you guys are enjoying this. Let me, let me see if there's anybody here I need to say hi to. Hey, Stephanie Davis, Chastain. Good to see you guys. Tabitha, good to see you as well. Doug Jones. Yep, Missy Gill. Roy, Nancy McCarry. All right, so you all still with me? If you're with me, give me a little amen or something here. I won't waste your time and keep you all up all night or something, but I got a couple more things to share with you that I think you're going to like. Woo! I got to stretch my back. This hurts. Can you? Oh, really? Somebody said something nice? Catherine. Catherine did? Thank you, Catherine. I will, I will read it later. <laughs> all right. Anyway, I see all your thumbs up. Awesome. Hope you guys are liking this. This is, uh, this is kind of therapeutic in the church is without walls. The church has left the building. And, uh, you know, when, when this all ends, the church is going to be different. It's going to be better. Um, you know, we have kicked the wall down and the, the whole world is, is seeing these and streaming. And, and uh, you know, I love it. The church has left the building. I love it. Awesome. Cool. Okay, good. I see all your amens. Awesome. All right. Number four. Got your pen ready? You taking notes? Number four. Invading problems produce dependency. Hmm. Invading problems produce dependency. Now, be honest, okay? It's just us. It's Potter's hand. You can take your masks off. You can be real here. Ain't nobody got it all together. Do any of us like to be dependent on anybody? Does any of us like to be dependent on another person or even on the Lord? Sometimes we we like to see the path in front of us clearly laid out. We like to see the certain number in our bank account. We like to know we've got this, this, this lined up for us to feel secure, for us to feel like, okay, all right, God's good. We got this. We go, right? But the minute that's shaken, the minute we're truly dependent on God, do we get a little uneasy? When Joseph found himself in prison, unjustly accused and confined in prison in Egypt, the Bible says in Genesis 39, 21, that the Lord was with him during that. Remember that. Over in the Psalms, the psalmist asked, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence, Lord? And King David told his son Solomon, the Lord God will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. That's 1 Chronicles 28, 20. God is always with us. Just as much in the good times as the bad, just as much as in peace as in trouble, just as much as in pandemic as in healthy times. Our goal, oh, this is deep, you ready? Because our goal is to match our dependency with his dependability. Man, that's good. That's not one of your notes, but it should have been. Let me say it again. Our goal is to match our dependency on his dependability. Because he is good. 
and he's dependable. They may not de be dependable the way you expect or the way you think, but remember, God is not our puppet. You know, that's so many people when they're spiritually growing or maybe they're immature, or maybe they're not even a believer in Christ. What they really think God is, is a genie. You know what I'm talking about? Well, I, prayer works. I prayed and he did that. Well, that sounds more like you're treating God as a great Santa Claus in the sky. Just rub the lamp, tell him what you want, and boom, he, it's his job to get it. That, that's not God. He doesn't answer to us. You know, that's, do you answer to your children? When, you know, how much more does our Heavenly Father know what's good for us and what we need? All right, so last one. I promise you I'd, I'd end with five of these. Number five, invading problems prepare our hearts to minister to others. And there it is. The whole point of this. Invading problems, when we have stress, when we have things coming, when we have things that rock our world or turn the world upside down in a matter of two to three weeks, they allow us to minister to others. God's order of events in this world is summarized beautifully in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Okay, I think it's verse 3, 4, and 5. Basically, it says this. You and I, we will experience problems. We'll experience troubles. Then God ministers to us. Then we go minister to other people, troubled people, with the same ministry that we received from God. You see how that works? Okay? We experience the problems and the troubles. God ministers to us. Then we are able to take that ministry to other troubled people and share the same ministry that we receive from God. It's a beautiful symbiotic circle. In other words, there is no better way to learn how to care for somebody than when you've walked through the fire. Remember chicken soup for the soul, right? There's no better way to learn how to make chicken soup for your friend's soul than to have survived yourself on it during a quarantine. Boom. That's pretty good. My wife's not impressed. Okay, that's fine. She just kind of stares at me. She, she knew all this. She knew all this. All right. You guys still with me? There's no better way to learn how to make spiritual chicken soup than if you've survived on it during quarantine yourself. So why do bad things happen to good people? The answer is in Matthew 5. It's because we live in a fallen world. God wants good people everywhere to look up. He wants to look up to him in times of trouble to see him as the one who is sovereign. Okay. Now, why do bad things happen to God's people? Well, to that question, I asked this. Where did God ever say Christians would be immune to troubles? God never said Christians would be immune to troubles or trials. And because he's given us an immune system, it's designed now to draw closer to him. We lean into him. Our, our goal is to allow God to carry us through and to preserve us from all these invading forces that are coming at us to try to take you out. And the enemy, I, I think the enemy is reeling right now. I think he really thought this would destroy the church. You know, he can't see the future. We forget that. He's not omniscient. We, we, we like to equate like yin and yang, like here's God, here's the devil. And the, it's not like that at all. Remember, the devil is a created being. So when, when he looks at the world, he has great wisdom because he's been around, you know, since, since the beginning of creation. But he can't see the future. So I think he thought, you know what, we're going to shut down churches. Oh, that's great. Churches went online. In fact, it's grown. Our reach has grown. We, we, we're reaching like a thousand people a week now. We've never done that. That's incredible. All because God has allowed, we just go, the church has left the building. And that, that's awesome. Our job is to share the truth now. And the devil, he's going to lose. God's immune system will protect us. And at the very, let's say the worst thing happens. Let's say... I get coronavirus. So let's say it takes me out. I go to be with the Lord. I, we, I get to live with him in a perfect, virus-free, glorified body. And we'll see each other again. I mean, we, again, we've got to keep, gotta keep the, the, the whole perspective here. You know, fear is not going to reign supreme in my heart. And I hope it doesn't in yours as well. All right, so I promised you I would share the ending of that story. The story of Keep Calm and carry on, okay? Remember, they destroyed the millions of copies of this famous poster. It was, it was uh, all run through a pulp mill and, and destroyed and thrown out and uh, used as fertilizer and mulch and, and whatever else they did. The destruction was so complete that the only known copies of this sign in existence are in the British archives. 
or so they thought. How many of you watch Antique Roadshow? Anybody? I, I, I just recently discovered it, and between that and Restaurant Impossible, oh my goodness, that show is addictive. It has nothing to do with this, but I just wanted to tell you that. Antique Roadshow was filming an episode overseas at St. Andrews University, okay? This is just, just a few years ago. And a woman from the small town of Fife came to the host of the show, Antique Roadshow, over in Great Britain, and she had a bundle of rolled-up posters, okay? There's like 15 of them, and they were all alike, and they were held together by an old kind of rotting rubber band. And when they asked where they got them from, she said, my father was a member of the Royal Observer Corps uh, back in the war, and he gave them to her years ago. So they took the posters, and they unrolled them. And lo and behold, they stared at bright red posters with five simple words on them. Keep calm and carry on. Now, here's what's amazing, okay? The first thing they did was try to authenticate them. And this was an incredible find because they were able to authenticate everyone as an original that somehow escaped and avoided being shredded and turned into pulp. The woman was being interviewed by a newspaper. And she said, and I'll do my British accent because it's always spot on. <laughs> Don't laugh. It's, it's terrible. I have a horrible. She said this. She said, the, the slogan is quite appropriate for my own personal circumstances because I recently lost my job. And I'm desperately looking for another one. <laughs> Amy is cracking up. Stop. They Just stop? No? Was it that bad? <laughs> so, so now get this, okay? She's desperate. She's lost her job. And she, she's, she's at the end of her rope. She's like, this couldn't have come at a better time. Little did she know that she would never have to work again. Those posters turned out to be worth a fortune. Are you ready for this? I'm, I'm going to land the plane. This is where it gets really deep. Behind those simple words lies the spiritual truth. And it is a truth that is just as relevant for us today. Even in chaotic times, times of pandemic, we can live with confidence because of Christ. Beneath the crown of the true king, the king of kings, and against a red backdrop of his cleansing blood, we can always keep calm and carry on. That's the message of Easter. That's the message coming up as we celebrate Holy Week. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I want to share with you a couple things that are coming down the pike, and I'm so excited about. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. Can you believe that? Palm Sunday. And uh, I was originally scheduled to be out of town taking the children of our church on my first chaperoning trip to Camp Willow Springs. Right? It was called Camp Willow Springs. Obviously, it got canceled, but thankfully, Bill was able to have his message already ready to speak, and he is going to be sharing a message from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53. All right, now, does anyone know why Isaiah 53 is one of my all-time favorite chapters? All right, let me scroll here and see if anybody, anybody can guess this. I'll just give you five seconds. I won't, I won't waste too much of your time on this. Isaiah 53, 5. You ready? Do, 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 do. Striper. Isaiah 53, 5. This is why they named their band, because... They wanted to remember, by his stripes, we are healed, okay? By his stripes, talk about the, the lashing, the cat of nine tails, all the stripes he took on his back. By his stripes, we are healed. So this Sunday, that's going to be our topic. Pastor Bill's going to be preaching from Isaiah 53, and uh, it is going to be awesome. Now, the following Wednesday, okay, one week from today, halfway through Holy Week, we're going to do something we've never done before. We're going to take the Lord's Supper all together, not like here together, but in your homes, okay? We're going to have communion. And so what we're going to do is over the next several days, if you're out and about and you can grab you, if you want to grab some bread or some unleavened bread or make your own, man, that would be fantastic. And get you some juice, whether it's grape juice or whatever you want to use. We're also going to have the pre-prepared cups and we're going to set them out. We, we've already ordered them. We've ordered a few hundred of them and we're going to have them. And when they arrive, I will take a picture and I'll show you where they're going to be so that when you're out and about, you can come and safely take as many as you need for your family or your neighbors. And you'll be able to have the wafer and the cup if you prefer to go with the, the more traditional ones that, that we serve. So those are going to be available coming pretty soon. I believe Jason said they come Monday, I think. Don't quote me on that. Jason, if you're there, you, you can comment. Um, 
And then I'll put them out probably under a covered stoop in in an enclosure so that you can come by and grab those. So Wednesday night, a week from today, I'll be leading a very special time during Holy Week. And uh, we'll conclude with taking the Lord's Supper all together in our homes. How cool is that? What a powerful time. That's going to be awesome. The following Sunday is Easter. And I won't steal all of Miss Leanne's thunder, but there's going to be some awesome stuff coming down the way, including maybe even a virtual Easter egg hunt for the kids. Going to be really, really cool. What the devil meant maybe for for harm, God's turning around. He's going to use it for good. And his message will go out. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And it's going to be an awesome week. Now, here's what else we're going to do. Because the the president mentioned this is going to be another at least 30 days, we're going to ramp up in a totally different way. And you'll pray for us because retooling the church to to function this way is totally different. they, They don't teach this in seminary. So we're praying through this and walking through this as well and trying to take things a week at a time. We're going to try to offer a daily devotion, a daily word of encouragement. Sometimes it'll be me, probably a lot of the times, but it's also going to be Pastor Bill and and Jason. Um, Leanne's got some. There's been a few guest people, maybe Eric and a few others that you'll see from time to time. And we're going to try to share one of those every weekday, Monday through Friday. All right. If you guys like that idea, let us know. Give us a thumbs up or something, uh, because it takes a, a lot of intentionality and effort to record them and then upload them. As the files get bigger and bigger, it gets harder and harder for some of these to, to make it. So, um, I hope that will continue to meet. So we'll go live on Wednesdays. We'll have something fresh for you every Sunday. And then every day also in between, we'll try to share with you a word of encouragement. Let me make sure I look at my list here, see if I've got anything else. All right, the last thing, I need your help. Please please spread the word that we're doing these. Not everybody is on social media. Not everybody's on Facebook. There's a lot of people in our church that may be feeling really out of the loop. And we're trying to call and text and email as many as we can but you don't have to have Facebook to see this Bible study. As soon as this is over, we upload it to the website. All you have to have is internet. And 99% of our church has internet. So don't let people feel totally discouraged and out of the loop. Our Sunday messages and our Wednesday Bible studies, once they're done, are already uploaded to YouTube. And if you don't know how to go to YouTube, just tell them, just go to phbiblechurch.org. That's it. And Jason has it right there on the front. It'll have the latest thing. And if you scroll down just a little bit, it'll say, watch our previous messages. Click that and it'll have all of them. Wednesdays, Sundays, important updates, all that. Okay. So for those who say, oh, I'm not on social media. I don't do Facebook thing. That's no problem. We get that. It's not for everybody, but we do want everybody to stay plugged in. And during this time, it's going to be important. So love each other. Reach out to your neighbors. Reach out to your small groups. Leaders, look after your flocks. Um, It's going to take all of us to do this. Okay. All right. Let me scan through this and and say hi to a few of these people. Um, Hey, Kim Collins, Donald and Brenda. Yeah. Nancy McCarroll. That's, uh, that's a great point. I like that. Melissa Noonan Farrar. Yeah, she knew it. She knew that it was Striper. Hey, Sarah Townsend. What's up, Hayden Woodard? How you doing, brother? Lindsay Winroth. You like that idea? Awesome. Good, good, good. Ruthie does too as well. Awesome. Thank you for your leadership. Oh, thank you, Hayden. God bless you, buddy. Thank you for being who you are and for your generous heart. Love you, man. Good, good. Ruthie likes that. Yep. Thank you, Pastor. Oh, you're welcome, Ruthie. Love you guys. Thank you. And uh, Lindsay, you bet. You bet. It does make a difference. This is what, this is, uh, you know, this is the church coming together. And the church was never about a building. And our church is handling this, honestly, better than a lot of churches I'm talking to, a lot of pastors, because you already knew that. Many of our people knew that this is just this is just rented space, and it's great, and I'm grateful for it, and I love it, and I miss being able to assemble here, but man, I'm grateful for this right here, Beep. to see you and to be able to, to stay in touch. So um, God bless you guys for, for staying in the loop. Keep loving each other. Keep talking to each other. Uh, when will the Daily Devotional start? Missy Gill, uh, how about tomorrow? Is tomorrow soon enough? <laughs> um, what we're doing is is we're trying to, to record a few and have them always ready. And then if there's anything that that, that uh, goes wonky with the uh, upload or whatever, we, we can always, if we can't live video one, we, we can always have one ready for you. Um, so two of our people, it's a surprise, have already uh, emailed me their devotionals and uh, they're great. So one of them will come tomorrow and the other one on, on Friday. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to, uh uh-oh, Hayden Woodard, need a cameo from Amy. There she is. Maybe you'll see her. I did my hair today, so I actually don't mind being as much as I usually mind. Maren did your hair? Yeah. It looks good. She didn't do mine. Hi, Hayden. 
top that you like, everybody. Brandon McCarroll. What's up, buddy? Jennifer, absolutely. Thank you for your, hey, ha I'm happy to do this, guys. Um, it's, 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 it's different work, but uh, I'm grateful to be able to do this. Shannon Renee, no, you rock, Shannon. Um, yes, we, we feel loved and appreciated. I hope you guys feel loved and appreciated. You guys are awesome. And um, yeah, Sarah, I like your comment. Nancy. Nancy says, hi, Amy. And so does Ruth D and Lindsay. She says, you're pretty as always. Yes, you are. All right. Well, I can't believe that almost everybody stuck around this long. Um, if you guys got any questions, feel free to fire away. Uh, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Actually, you can stay here and uh, you can stay home. No problem. Um, all right. Let me see if there's anything else. So good to see you guys. Owen's looking for Mercy. Aww. We were going to bring Mercy again. As Amy was driving here tonight, bringing me a little dinner, she fell asleep again. So she and Marin are stuck in the minivan. <laughs> Having a good time corralling her. Uh, it's a lot easier when she's asleep. All right, let me see if there's anything else I was going to share with you guys. I think we're caught up. Um, Easter's coming up. Might give you a challenge. I'm praying about something here. And uh, I'm, I'm really, really excited about what God's doing. So stay faithful to each other and um, check, check on your neighbors. You know, we, we try to call some people as, as the Lord lays on our hearts, especially some of the older people that, you know, may not be as active on social media. And if God does that to you, if somebody comes across your mind or heart, a lot of times that's, that's, there's a reason, you know. So um, call each other and, and say, hey, did you know you can get online and you can just, you know, you can see a, a Bible study message. And, you know, it's, it may not be being here together, but. It's the next best thing, and we can, you know, kind of span these miles and do that. All right, let me see if there's anything else. Okay, yeah, men's conquerors, you meet right after this. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, James, for doing that and continuing with your small group. Um, I've heard several of you are doing WebEx and uh, Skype and, and uh, Zoom and different things. Keep doing that for your groups. God bless you for it. Um, that's awesome. All right. Braden misses his family. Yeah, I miss all you guys. Keep posting pictures. That's how we stay in touch. And uh, I love you guys. Let me pray for you, okay, before we go. Lord, you are good. I thank you for this time with this great church family. I thank you for my brothers and sisters who, who carved out this hour to be together. Thank you for the koinonia fellowship you give us. Across the miles, the spirit knows the spirit. And we feel almost as if we are still connected, as if we are in the room together. And I thank you. That's something only you can do. We give you all credit for it. God, I pray that you would sustain all those people who are on the front lines. We pray for our, our leaders, our national leaders. We pray for our governor. We pray for our, our mayor. We lift up all the other churches that are uh, ministering right now to their flocks. God, we pray for those pastors. We love them. We pray for all these nurses and doctors and the people who are researching cures and things like uh, that are so far above our, our pay grade. Lord, would you sustain them? I know they're tired, and I know some of them are so discouraged and just worn out, Lord. So we pray as a, as a church, we pray for those first responders, and we ask that you would infuse them with holy energy, with good rest when they can get it, with peace at home when they have few hours to, to get away, and that you would sustain them, Lord. We put them in your hands. God, thank you again for your word. It never returns void, and we're grateful. We love you. We pray in your name always. Amen. And amen. Awesome. I love you guys. I will see you online. I'll be around. As always, I'm here for you. Uh, send me an email, text, call, um, and uh, we'll stay in touch. God bless you guys. Have a great rest of the night.